Okay, let's talk about intelligence. Okay, so in this chart, let's focus in on the um, x-axis. Let's start with the x-axis to begin with. Okay, so you see the ages, right? 25, 32, 39, so on, up to 81 years old. Then if we look at the y-axis, we see the reasoning ability score, and this is an intelligence test. Um, and the scores are ranging from 35 on the low end and 60 on the high end. Okay. Now, intelligence and how it changes across the lifespan really matter, it really matters how we measure your intelligence. You know, like what strategy we use, not what test we use, but what strategy we, we, we use to assess developmental changes. If we look at the orange bar on this graphic, we see what is called the cross-sectional method. Um, and what it suggests is that intelligence declines. See how sharply the, the orange um, line is dropping off. In the cross-sectional method, if we look at the x-axis, we've got different groups of people in each of those age groups. So you have a group of 25-year-olds, a group of 32-year-olds, a group of 39-year-olds, and so on, up to a group of 81-year-olds. So each age group consists of different people. We give the test all in one day, and then we compare the different age groups' performance and we get this red line that shows that the 25-year-olds did way better than the 81-year-olds. Um, almost get the impression the 81-year-olds should be like babbling and drooling based on this test, right? So significant decline in intelligence test scores across the age groups when you test different people. Now, there's some stuff that's wrong with that method, which is, for example, the fact that there are other things besides simply age that might differ among these groups, right? If we look at a person who today is 81 versus a person who today is 25, besides their age, there are things that we call the cohort effect. Being part of different cohorts may cause the different age groups to perform differently. 81-year-olds, for example, are less likely to have gone to college than today's 25-year-olds are. Um, today's 81-year-olds are less familiar with Scantron bubble-in response um, sheets than today's 25-year-olds are. So there might be like some just fundamental differences between these groups that don't make them comparable, right? Um, and that it might be those things that cause the 81-year-olds to score lower than the 25-year-olds and not just natural aging. In other words, a tw the person who is 25 years old and took this test can't look at these results and come to the conclusion that, well, by the time I'm 81, I'll be scoring like that. Because there are significant things different between the 25-year-old group and the 81-year-old group. The thing about the cross-sectional method is it's quick. I can gather these different age groups all today, administer the test, and have my you know data analyzed by tomorrow. It's quick, um, but it may be inaccurate. The longitudinal method is what's represented in the green bar, and it suggests that intelligence is stable across the lifespan. Now, in the longitudinal method, you start off with a group of 25-year-olds, and then you retest them every seven years. So you test them again when they're 32, again at 39, and so on, until they're 81 years old. So using this method, you see, well, intelligence really peaks in midlife, and the 81-year-olds are scoring barely lower than the 25 year than they did when they were 25. Um, that kind of implies that, I always like to joke with my in-person students that, you know, based on the longitudinal design, you're about as dumb as you're ever going to get, right? Because it's like, You'll, you'll be pretty stable across your lifespan. In fact, if, if you do a statistical analysis, that, that green line is basically flat statistically. So you're going to stay pretty stable across your adult lifespan. Yay! There are some problems with this method also. One major glaring problem is if I test you every seven years, there's the possibility that you're um, just giving me the same answers every time because you, you remember the previous test well enough you know, by the time you've taken it for the fifth time, it's possible that you're just giving me the same answer. and You really don't, you wouldn't have scored like that if it was the first time you'd seen it at age 60 or something like that. Um, that's possible. Of course, one of the ways that they get around that argument is that they actually have different forms of the same basic test so that you're not taking the same exact test every time.
Plus, there's seven years difference. I mean, if you can remember your answers from seven years ago, that's got to be a sign of intelligence, doesn't it? So, um, so that one's kind of a weaker argument. Uh, the main reason why there aren't that many studies that are done in a longitudinal fashion is that it just takes so gosh darn much time. I mean, we're looking at a 60-year study practically here, right? Actually, this kind of study has been being done. It's called the Seattle Longitudinal Study, and they started it in the 1930s, and they've got participants who are in their 80s now who they keep retesting, and um, that's where we got this kind of data. If you follow people over their lifetime, whatever your existing level of intelligence is seems to be stable across your adult lifespan. One additional criticism of this design, though, is that only the healthiest people are still alive to be participating at these oldest ages. And so there may be a bias towards um, looking like you maintain your intelligence when in fact as long as you are a healthy person you'll maintain your intelligence. I'd like to point out that with the cross-sectional method when you're looking at the 67, 74, 81 year olds you're still same thing looking at the healthiest members of society right because they've made it to those older ages so um, that doesn't really fully explain why it declines so sharply in cross-sectional versus longitudinal. Um, but, okay, so it's hard to do longitudinal, but we definitely can see the benefit of taking the time to do it. The other thing about intelligence I wanted to point out is that there are different kinds of intelligence. Fluid versus crystallized. Fluid intelligence, which is represented by the dotted line in this graphic, so the blue area would be the, the scores. And you see infancy, it peaks in early adulthood, and then it tapers off into late adulthood. Um, Fluid intelligence is your ability to read and reason speedily. Now, if you remember a few lectures back, I talked about um, you know the benefits of exercise and and um, practice with co complex tasks and stuff like that. You can really keep your fluid intelligence a lot healthier longer if you engage in those kinds of activities. I'm not saying necessarily to play those lumosity games because there's really no scientific evidence to support that that does anything for you except for make you better at specifically those games, but varied cognitive challenges can really help to maintain your flu fluid intelligence. Crystallized intelligence tends to accumulate across your lifespan because it's your accumulated knowledge and skills. So as we get older we know more and more stuff. Um, it's one of the reasons why older people enjoy playing Jeopardy because they're like, oh my gosh, I know the answers to these things and, and it makes them look really smart compared to younger people who haven't read as much or seen as many movies or you know, been exposed to as many things over there you know, as an older person has. One theory on why fluid intelligence seems to wane as we get older is that as we get older we have fewer truly novel experiences to try and reason through. And so we oftentimes, as we get older, try one of our crystallized strategies that has worked in the past. Um, oh yeah, this looks like a, a problem I've seen before. And so we'll try that strategy first, and then when we realize it doesn't adequately answer the question, then we fall back on actually trying to approach it from a novel um, perspective. On the internet, there's a test that I just recently found, because there's a game show network called this, um, The Idiot test, I think it's called, yeah, the idiot test, and the idiot test is designed to take advantage of the fact that you have some crystallized intelligence based on, you know, that pertains to these kinds of um, problem solving tests that you encounter on, on the idiot test, and it knows that you're going to jump to a conclusion, and that's going to slow you down when you first try your, oh, I think I know this, and then you realize it doesn't work, then you have to go to a, a fluid approach, and that takes time and makes you look dumb. Is it really a sign of being dumb if you think you might already know an answer to it and try it first? I don't think so. So crystallized intelligence might be an exp explanation for why fluid seems to wane as we get older. Now one of the things we worry about a lot as young people who have older relatives or young people we wor worry about for ourselves is that when we get older we'll experience dementia. Um, here we see a graphic that shows that hardly anybody in the 60 to 64 year range is experiencing some kind of dementia, but by the time you're in the 90 to 95 year range, you're looking at about 40% of people have some form of dementia. The most uh, commonly known form of dementia is called Alzheimer's disease, or some people now are calling it just Alzheimer's disease. Um, 
in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, uh, you actually see more activity going on in the brain of the person who isn't showing any symptoms yet, maybe having a little bit of forgetfulness surrounding recent events, maybe can't remember what they had for dinner last night, um, maybe can't remember the name of their new paper delivery boy who just started last week, something like that. Um, you see on the left a person who is at risk, who ultimately went on to develop Alzheimer's disease, and on the right you see the person who's normal and never, you know, gets a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. You see more of the uh, hot yellow colors in the person who's at risk, and hot yellow and white are associated with more brain activity. You also see a wider swath of the brain being used for solving the same kind of problem as the normal person uses less brain matter. Um, one theory on this is that as the disease starts to affect your brain, you will marshal whatever resources you have to try and approach the problem without any noticeable deficit in your output. Um, but ultimately, as the disease progresses, you'll lose your ability to marshal those kinds of resources and you'll start to see the, de the, the, uh, the deficits. The idea with Alzheimer's is that it starts down in your brain stem and starts to deteriorate neurons are, yeah, neurons that are supposed to be stimulating higher level parts of your brain. And in the absence of the stimulation that normally comes up from those lower, lower areas, your brain starts to delete neurons thinking that you don't need them anymore. Even to the point where it starts to delete out memories and things like that. Inhibitions and other kinds of things. So Alzheimer's is a special case of dementia. Um, the most common kind of dementia, by the way, is one that's called multi-infarct dementia, and it's a kind that's caused by stroke. Uh, and the thing that really differentiates those kinds of dementias that are caused by stroke or um, other kinds of brain injuries versus Alzheimer's is that Alzheimer's is progressive. Once you start to show symptoms, you get worse and worse. A person with multi-infarct dementia, once they've had the stroke, they tend not to, to get any worse after that. They'll stabilize unless they have another stroke. So that's the big difference in those types of dementia. Okay, we're going to take a break here and come back and talk about social development in the next segment.